Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, we live in a period of unprecedented turmoil, and every day in dozens of countries, humanitarian crises are unfolding with uh, millions of people being impacted. Across the globe, 65 million people are displaced from their homes as a result of conflict. And according to last year's Global Humanitarian Overview, 134 million people needed humanitarian assistance and protection. That's why the United Nations has designated the 19th of August as the World Humanitarian Day, a day to remember the devastating human costs of uh, conflict and disaster across the planet and the critical role that humanitarian um, action plays. It's also a day to pay tribute to the incredible contribution of humanitarian workers who place themselves in the path of danger, often at great personal risk, in order to help others in need. This year, World Humanitarian Day is particularly focused on celebrating women humanitarian workers. A large number of global humanitarian workers are women. They are amongst the first to respond and the last to leave a crisis. I am very glad that they are being recognised for their contribution this year. I was privileged enough to see the positive impacts of aid work uh, firsthand when I visited Bangladesh back in November 2017 on the invitation of humanitarian organisations uh, Care Australia and Oxfam. At that stage, more than 700,000 Rohingya uh, people, mostly women and children, were fleeing violence and persecution from Myanmar uh, and walking across on mass uh, across the border into Bangladesh in order to seek protection. This mass exodus from Myanmar over a very short period of time saw the rise of some massively overcrowded refugee camps throughout Cox's Bazaar. Thousands of traumatised people living in cramped makeshift camps, stretching out for kilometres as far as the eye can see. This was one of the most confronting sights I've ever encountered. The concentration of refugees in Cox's Bazaar is amongst the densest in the world. And there are now more than uh, there are more Rohingya people living in Bangladesh than in their homeland of Myanmar. But Cox's Bazaar also gave me some really unique insights into the work of humanitarian aid workers, which surely must be the most noble of all professions. Uh, certainly, the women I saw undertaking the work around uh, the women's only clinics, which were a really important part of the work um, being done in Cox's Bazaar, ensuring the um, uh, health and well-being of mothers and children. As I said, more than half of the refugee population in Cox's Bazaar were indeed children. Uh, and the role that the women aid workers um, played in that really critical time when there was a need for great protection of women and children who had already been subject to some of the most gross uh, forms of violence uh, you could imagine. Um, they were an essential part of ensuring that those uh, services were properly targeted and indeed um, you know, just clamouring at that time when so many people were arriving. Um, the trust of having those women there was absolutely essential. And, um, but none of those efforts could have happened without funding. And last year, the United Nations estimated that we needed more than $25 billion uh, across the globe to help more than 100 million people who were in need. The actual amount that was spent was just uh, $15 billion, a shortfall of almost half of what was needed. Uh, none That means not enough is actually being done. And regretfully, Australia is one of the worst offenders here. In 2008, the very first, in his very first speech in this House, the Prime Minister Scott Morrison praised the government for increasing foreign aid, adding that Australia still must go further. He went on to condemn the fact that the global aid budget was only a third of what was needed, saying, and I quote, this leaves a sizeable gap. The need is not diminishing, nor can our support. It is the Australian thing to do. It's hard to imagine, but this man, this man who spoke with such passion and strength about the importance of aid, is the same man who supported more than $11 billion of cuts into Australia's aid budget since Liberals came to power. Indeed, many of those cuts were at his own hand when he was the Treasurer. And as Prime Minister, he oversaw a further $115 million cuts in the last April budget. It's time that those opposites stood up and started acting like the responsible government.
government by reversing some of the damage that they have done by cutting our overseas aid budget. I